welcome. So I have always, at the end of my program, I generally ask people to comment down below. I love your comments. As you probably know, if you've ever commented, I respond. I, I, whatever your comment is, I respond. Another thing I have often done is I've solicited your suggestions. I love your suggestions because it generally means if I'm responding to a suggestion, it means that it's something you're interested in and I want to give you information that you're interested in. Well, a gentleman by the name of Alex, I won't give his last name, but his first name is Alex. Alex made seven suggestions. And Alex, I'm going to take each one of these suggestions and go through them. And if I don't do it justice, please comment and say, Dave, you, you just didn't hit the nail on the head. Try it this way, and I'm going to try it that way. I'm not going to do these in order. I'm going to do them uh, in a way that, that uh, I'm going to need to do research. As you know, Alex, because you and I have exchanged email, I'm going to need to do some research on a few of them. And that's why I'm doing them out of order. So uh, uh, suggestion number three, let me just read it to you. A market segment for those who are 55 plus, that is they're 55 years of age or older with completed families, maybe getting back into the live uh, art of magic and have a particular interest in history and collecting. You know, I, I have never been an active, intentional collector. But I find that I have quite a collection, uh, both of books. I have books that you cannot get. If you tried, you couldn't get them. They're just simply not available. Uh, they, were, they were published in very limited supply, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time, and I got them, and I have them in my library. I also have props, you know, I, I, have, uh, I have been doing magic actively since 1968. And I have been actively purchasing magic, books and props, since 1968. Now I will tell you that I'm trying to survive because I don't have a day job any longer. I don't have a... Uh, a salary or a paycheck. So uh, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm, I'm selling merchandise on eBay. In fact, I opened a magic shop which is connected to my eBay shop. And I'm, I'm selling a lot of different things on eBay. Uh, I, I love vintage and antiques of all kinds. I'm actually holding back some of my finer antiques and vintage uh, material for Etsy. I'm going to open up an Etsy store. I'm going to focus specifically on uh, things like uh, like this. Now, this might make no sense to you guys whatsoever, but this this is a vintage sand pail, probably from the 1950s, maybe the 1940s. The fact that it was painted on the inside sets it up a little bit later. They, uh, toy manufacturers have been making sand pails since the Victorian age, uh, the Victorians were really the first to enjoy beach vacations. And so they, uh, toy manufacturers saw the, uh, and responded to this. Now, in, in the early days, they used to use uh, wooden buckets. And then toy manufacturers began to fashion uh, sand pails out of tin. So in the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, manufacturers of toys began using plastic and that's when everything became ugly. You know, instead of buying something that's beautifully lithographed like this in tin, you can choose from blue, pink, or yellow. Plastic. Seriously. Um, from a practical point of view, sure, it doesn't rust, it doesn't break, it doesn't have sharp edges. I get all that from a parental point of view, but... Uh, from an aesthetic point of view, uh, ugh. So I, I collect that stuff, and uh, and and I and I'm looking to sell it on uh, on Etsy. Oh, let me show you something. 
I picked this up at a flea market last week. This is charter member of the Batman and Robin Society. This this was a a pin that was awarded to you if you joined the Batman and Robin Society back in the days when it was on TV, early 60s. Uh, I thought this was fantastic. Get it home. Uh, so, you know, you don't know. When, when you're out there buying, uh, you don't always know what something's valued at. You have to get it home and do the research. I get it home, I do the research on this thing, and it's basically valueless, you know, basically. So, but, but hey, I think it's pretty cool. I, I remember Batman back in the day. So, uh, hokey, crazy television show, but uh, I, I like it, and it's, it's in my collection. Anyway, uh, Alex, your question has to do with magic, not all that stuff. My point is that I have a lot of collectible magic, but I have not sought to acquire collectible magic for its own sake. Um, I know there are guys, I know people personally that collect Martinka. I know people personally that collect magic posters. Um, if you are interested in collecting magic, plan on spending thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, uh, I don't, I'm not prepared right now to give you specific dollar amounts, but I will tell you that a Houdini signature goes for thousands. An original poster, not a repo. I mean, you can buy uh, reproduction magic posters that are lovely. You can get them in various sizes. They're very attractive. So if you just want the art, I would suggest that you buy the reproductions. I think, um, I, Alex, you mentioned it yourself. I think uh, Norm Nielsen, uh, his website offers um, reproduction posters at a very good value. You can also buy reproduction magic posters. I'm talking now from the vintage period or from the, uh, from the golden age, from the turn of the 19th century on up into the, 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 the 1919s, the 20s, the 30s, and so on. You can buy these posters um, on Amazon at a very good rate. You can buy them on eBay at a very good rate. So you can get those easily and affordably if you want the real thing. First of all, they're enormous. I had the privilege of being uh, very good friends with Denny Haney, who decided he wanted to collect authentic posters. And so uh, I remember when he opened his shop, he had no posters. By the time he was, uh, he had to step down because of his illness. But by the time he stopped, he had, the walls were lined with authentic, genuine posters. I have no idea where that collection went. Uh, Probably Scott Alexander has them, probably, but I don't know that for certain. Um, but if you if you put a, if you tried to put a value on his collection at the end, I I I, I don't know this for certain, but I would it, it's got to be close to a million dollars in 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 uh, in magic posters. I mean, it was it was quite a collection, and these things do not come cheap. Uh, so, if you want to do that, there are certainly ways to do it. There are auction houses, there are specialty dealers that, that deal specifically with magic collectibles. Um, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate in that I li lived a long time and I consistently collected, so I have a lot of interesting props. Uh, that are no longer manufactured in books that are no longer made as well. Uh, you can certainly search these things out on eBay. Uh, I, I have released a lot into the fraternity that, that I was hanging on to simply because I'm trying to pay my bills, you know, so I'm, I'm selling a lot of stuff that I probably wouldn't otherwise have sold. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm doing that. And a lot of magicians find themselves in that spot. You know, they, they, they're like me. They've collected. And they get to a certain point in their lives, and uh, sometimes it's not about surviving. Sometimes it's not about um, creating income. Sometimes it's simply that you come to the realization. And, and, and let, let me give you a little personal story here. Uh, my mother was a collector. She collected precious moments. She collected cat's meow. 
She collected dolls, uh, beautiful bisque dolls. Uh, she had a variety of collections. And, um, and uh, when she passed uh, and my dad became sick, uh, he has dementia and he had to be, he needed care. We needed to create income uh, to help offset the enormous cost of care for someone who has dementia. And uh, so we had to we had to get the house ready for renting quickly. So we didn't have time to do an estate sale or to do the things that you would love to be able to do to liquidate assets. So basically we, we donated. I had, I had a friend who uh, was able to take a lot of furniture to another place to get that donated. Uh, I had other friends that collected and, and they came in and they were able to take a lot of those things. But, but my point in sharing the story is you can't take it with you. And at some point, you look at your collection and you say, and, I, and I, I, I'm at the point myself where I'm saying, you know, I'm not going to use that. At least I don't think I'm going to use it. And so you release it back into the fraternity. And my avenue for doing that has been eBay. Uh, there are other avenues. There's Etsy. Um, there are other auction houses. There are, again, there are specialty houses and so on. And if you want specific references, please let me know. I'll be happy to provide those in a future vlog. Uh, but Alex, you asked me specifically to address the idea of history and collecting. Now, history is a different matter. Uh, there are magic historical societies. I'm not actually a part of them. Uh, I'm, I'm very well read. I, I read everything. I have a vast collection. Uh, Mike Caveney, by the way, uh, is, is, a, is a favorite publisher of mine uh, as far as magic history is concerned. Here's a book that he published on Carter the Great. Uh, the publishing house is uh, Magic Words by Mike Caveney. Uh, he actually wrote the book. Uh, but what you get in, in these books, uh, just, just to let you know, uh, generally speaking, by the way, the books are enormously entertaining, uh, but look at that. You get uh, reproductions of some of the great uh, posters that Carter used. Back in the Golden Age, this was a primary means of promoting a show. You, you would send a, a front man into a town where you were headed, and the front man would literally line the streets with these posters to create some interest and, uh, and get people excited about the show that was coming to town. Uh, so this was a primary means of promotion back in the day, back in the Golden Age. Uh, but I recommend, if you if you are interested in magic history and you are not collecting magic words books from Mike Caveney's publishing house, you are missing a huge resource when it comes to magic history. So please check that out. Alex, um, that's kind of my two cents worth. Now, as far as being over 50 and being involved or getting re-involved in magic, re-engaging magic. Um, you know, my, my orientation, while I love history and I present a lot of history here on this channel and I love collecting and I do that as well, um, magic is a performance art. And you know what? There's a lot of great people in magic. Um, there's the Dr. Albo, I think his name is, um, just off the top of my head. There's a lot of great people in magic who strictly collect or who strictly study or who they're historians or they're collectors, but they don't perform. And that's fine. I don't mean to pass any judgments on that at all. But for me, I've always had the ambition of earning a significant portion of my income through strictly performance as opposed to writing histories or anything else because when you perform magic you connect with it i i can relate to carter's struggles 
and to what Carter experienced. I, I, I'm certainly not on his level. Carver was a great illusionist of the golden age. He just missed. He tried to board the Titanic to cross the ocean to come back to America. And they would not allow him on board because of the size of his cargo. Uh, otherwise, he'd have gone down with the Titanic. Um, so he just missed that. But, but I, I can relate to these stories on a personal level because I'm struggling to, to succeed as a performer myself. Um, so it, it, it makes the stories and it makes the histories so much more relevant. Uh, when you do take that time. And the reason I mention that is, let's say that you're 50 or 60 or 70 years old and you decide for the first time, I want to get involved in magic. There is no age limit. There's no age restriction. So if you decide that you want to perform, let me be the first to encourage you to do so. Put together a good act, an act that is anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. Hone it, rehearse it, practice it. I would suggest if you're doing it for the first time, don't do mentalism unless your heart's really in it. Stick to traditional magic, uh, things like maybe the cups and balls or a chop cup, uh, so egg bag, things of that nature, Chinese sticks. Put together a routine, practice it up, and volunteer to do it maybe at a church or maybe at a retirement home or a library, something like that. And do that a few times so that you, you audience test it. And then you can begin to advertise and promote it. Um, and you can do that at any age. Uh, and you will love it. You will love it. The magic is the most wonderful thing. Uh, it, it's a gift. And, and I love it, and I hope that you do too. Alex, thank you so much for your suggestions. And, 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 and if you, anyone else, if you have a suggestion, please make it down below. Please comment. Please subscribe. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you next time.